Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas. And we put up a video every week. So don't forget to subscribe and press the alert button so that you'll be reminded every week so that you can come along on our amazing horticultural adventures. Oh, and they are amazing. And today we are in a leafy glade. It's midsummer and it's a little chilly. What could we be looking at today, Stephen? but we're going to talk about a specific genus of plants. Mm. They are very useful, very attractive, yes. and very entertaining plants to have in the garden. Entertaining? Yeah, they do song and dance. Almost. Okay. But we will get to what, how I see them as being entertaining in due course. All right, well, you have me intrigued. Let's go and have a look. All right, what a good idea. Is it these, Stephen? It certainly is. Oh, Fabulous is it... plants. In fact, they're known commonly as glory flowers, which yes. might be taking things a bit far. Who knows? Well, no, it is glorious. Yeah. That is stunning. <gasps> and the, the deep magenta buds before they open yeah. to a light pink. It's lovely. Now, it we better get to all of the details. Tell us details. this thuggy brute's name. All right. Its name is Clerodendrum. Yes. Uh, that's the genus, of course. Mm. This particular species is Clerodendrum Bungii. Bungii. Named after Alexander von Bunge, who was an Estonian botanist who died in 1890. Of so course he, he was. Had, yes, of course he was. Mr. Bunge, I presume. Now, Clerodendrum itself is an interesting name yeah. because dendrum, of course, means tree. Yes. And a lot of these aren't trees. <laughs> a lot of them are shrubs or mm. climbers or whatever. Yeah. And the clero bit means chance. And the reason it means... Chance tree. Yeah, well, that's the literal translation. But what they were actually alluding to is that there was some sort of medicinal qualities about these plants, but you might have to take a chance. <laughs> so oh, I'm not quite sure. That is that a long bow. It is a long bow. So Clerodendrum, it's a genus of some 250-odd species, mm. mainly tropical. So mm. there's only a handful of them that I would class as temperate plants that yep. I can grow in my climate. Such as Bungii. Such as Bungii. And it certainly is a th suckering thug. It wafts all over the garden and comes up everywhere. Uh, it's reasonably easy. I don't try and dig it out. I just pull out the suckers that go out further than I want. In a year, how often would you have to control it Once. suckering? Once a year. Once a year, I'll go around. I generally do it in the winter because I have an ulterior motive. You could do it at any time of the year. Okay. But What's... if I pull the suckers out in the winter, I can pop them up and sell them to some other sucker. <laughs> I don't think you should allude to that. Yeah, but, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I do it in the winter because I can reuse the plant material. So this is actually growing underneath a huge ulnus tree from mm. Peru, ulnus acuminata. Oh, it's which, Peruvian. Yes, and it has enormous root systems. Ah. Uh, and not much will grow under this tree. So the clerodendrum is doing it superbly, and it's filling up a gap that I would otherwise struggle to grow anything. So interesting. Oh, you know, my tiny mind is exploding about how you then consider the best place to use something that is perhaps a bit more of an aggressive suckering thug. Yeah, yeah. well, and that's the sort of thing you have to think out if you're, if you're planting a garden. Mm particularly with plants that have uh, their own will to get to live. So we have actually included this in a story about dry shade. Yes. Or plants for shade. So this is a, a dry shade plant. It is. It will cope very well with dry shade. It will cope with some sun as well. It's not it? too fussed. Well, we'll show you the one just around the corner viewers that perhaps is looking a little too sunned. Yes. It, a bit droopy. Yeah. Uh, it will flag on hot days a bit like hydrangeas do, but in fact, uh, they tend to stand up overnight. So it doesn't normally get to a, a, a level where you start getting foliage it's critical. burn and things like that. Well, then let's, let's sort of talk about general care for this particular right. one, because there's other clerodendrons we're going to look at. Yeah. Um, so where is this one from, Bungie? Uh, this one is Chinese through those sort of Southern Asian countries. And a uh, bit of altitude, I'd imagine, given that this can take cold weather. Yes, uh, it will frost mm. occasionally, so it'll only cope with minor frosts. Yeah. And again, I treat this sort of like... I don't know how to explain this. I suppose I could say part-time perennial. So what I do with this one is that every year or two, I go through and I cut out the older, longer and branch stems. Mm -hmm. And then I leave the younger single stemmed uh, parts, mm -hmm. which will have the best flowers. Right. So I just cull out older material. Because what I've noticed is it does seem to be largely single stems. Is that its habit that it, it's very... Only because I cut out the other bits. Right. So because it will normally branch. So if I leave that, branch, that piece of plant there, yeah. 
and I don't cut it out, next year it will start to branch out and I may well get several flowers on the stem. Mm. But the flower quality will be smaller, the foliage gets smaller, mm. so the plant isn't quite as exciting. But one thing you haven't noticed, and you normally do things like this, you haven't bent in and had a whiff. I did, I smelt it earlier oh. on. And it's not that pleasant. I think it's all right. But I have to say, now, this is the entertaining bit. Okay. Rub the foliage and smell your fingers. Nothing. Nothing? Oh, come on. Burning rubber. Uh, okay, that is again a long bow, possibly, but burning rubber aside, the leaves are actually really handsome they form. Are. They're very handsome. They'll often get a slightly burgundy-ish reverse to them. Yep. Uh, so the foliage is good quality. Mm. It is fully deciduous, so it will shed all its leaves in the winter. Okay. Yeah, it flowers in that late summer into early autumn period where I think it is particularly useful. Indeed, indeed. Could you grow this in pots? You could. Because it's a fairly vigorous plant, though, it may require extra feeding, watering, and maybe dividing periodically to mm. keep it going. Because it's time. just got such great form. It would look amazing in pots and in a shady spot. Yeah. So you could grow this in milder parts of southern England. Easily. Uh, I've seen it growing in gardens in Sussex and all sort of the southern oh, parts okay, of England. Okay. It will grow into slightly more tropical climates. Mm. Uh, so you could probably grow this in Florida but it probably isn't going to be happy in far north Canada. Yeah, no, <laughs> it will die. Well, this is a beauty. Now then, there are more chlorodendrons we're looking at. Yes, I have others. <gasps> well, <laughs> let's go. Why not? Chlorodendron 2, Stephen. Yes, and this one is an even more cold hardy variety. Oh, okay. And it is Chlorodendron trichotomum. Trichotonum. Yeah, and it's common. Tri meaning three. Three, and I don't know what the tomum's about. So. But what's the three about? I don't know that either. Who <laughs> knows? Uh, it's commonly known as the Harlequin glory flower, yeah. and one of its common names. And it makes a small deciduous tree. Mm -hmm. It suckers like there's no tomorrow. We've got it behind us here, and I have got a serious copse of it. So it, it has suckered right through the garden. But you grow it as a small tree. It's not like the Clerodendron bungii that you would cut down on a regular basis because yeah. it needs to have some old wood to then produce the shorter shoots that will then produce the clusters of flowers. Right. Now, one of its other common names, hopefully you, uh, if you have a... A good whiff, you might be able to pick up the scent. It doesn't seem to be very smelly today. That's not a nice smell. Well, do you know what one of its common names is? No. Uh, the peanut butter tree. Oh, we see, I hate peanut butter yeah. with every fiber of my being. It's, I, it's not a pleasant smell. I wouldn't have immediately thought peanut no, butter. No, most people don't. Uh, I know I've tested people when we've been on tour overseas because well, you regularly see this in gardens in France and England and North America. Yeah. I saw some beautiful plants of it growing in gardens in Portland, Oregon when I was there years ago. Okay. So it's obviously quite a commonly grown tree in Northern Hemisphere temperate gardens, yeah. but we don't see it very often here. In, in Australia? Yeah. So, given it's suckering, but it's a tree, now the big question is again, how often do you have to maintain its suckeringness? Is this once a year? Is it yeah, constant? Once a year, thereabouts. Occasionally I'll have a wayward sucker that will come up in the middle of a path or something like that that needs immediate attention. Uh, but generally speaking, I go in and I clean out some of the older trunks. I pull out suckers that I don't want. Again, I'd probably do this mainly in the winter because then the excess suckers can be potted up but you could do it at any time of the year if you had no need for the excess plant material and um in terms of the fact that it's a small tree do you just allow one step if you wanted to just allow one stem to become the tree or does it need to be like a cluster of three or four to have any sort of presence i like it to have cleanish trunks because mm. i like to be able to walk under it because it's growing quite close to a path so i mm. need to be able to sort of drift past it so i'm inclined to encourage it up so i'll often prune off side branches and things like that to keep the canopy up in the air a bit mm. but it really depends on where you're growing it i've seen this plant grown as an individual specimen plant in a lawn yeah where obviously the lawn mower is taking ah, care of it. so anything. very much like a specimen tree yeah you could grow it as a specimen tree as long as you had it in a lawn where you could manage the suckers and it made a quite nice round-headed small tree probably about four and a half five meters so, you know, 20-ish feet. And it has a very elegant form, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, it sort of branches and then branches again. Mm. So you get this nice sort of tiered, layered effect to it. And, of course, it doesn't stop with its peanut butter smell. <laughs> 
Just stop with it, Peter. What's those birds? <laughs> There's a couple of eastern spinebills just went past almost under my very nose. It's peanut butter scented leaves are entertaining. I mean, there's something to just fool your friends with. I it's, didn't smell peanut butter, just it's saying. white flowers in the late summer are lovely, mm. but it really comes into its own when it goes into its seeding mode. Oh, yeah. Because these green calyxes you've got behind the flower, yeah. they open out flat. Yes. They go a rather strong raspberry pink. And in the center of each one will be a beautiful dark turquoise blue berry. Wow. And we have got a picture of that, which we will yes. attach. So, and that show goes on for quite a while after as well. So um, pays its way. And what about the foliage? Is that doing anything in autumn? or is No, it just, just so that it goes a yellowish color and drops. And so drops unfortunately, off. the autumn foliage is not its thing. And how long do those seeds, the colorful seeds, remain? Oh, you'll get some weeks out of it, probably four or five weeks out of it in the autumn. Oh, okay. Maybe longer. Now, did we talk about where this one is from? Uh, this one is also Chinese and through northern parts of Southern Asia, so mm -hmm. uh, mountains of Thailand, all that sort of thing. But it does grow up into much colder areas, so it's a more mountainous species, mm. uh, hence being solidly deciduous yep. and hence being probably the most cold hardy in its genus. And so you could basically grow this anywhere in Europe, in Britain, um, in North America. Yeah, I would say so. I would hesitate again, uh, unlike bungee eye, which would probably grow right in the more humid subtropical areas, this one may not be as good in those areas. Mm. Uh, probably survive, but whether it flowers and fruits well, I don't know. Mm. But yeah, certainly for temperate to colder climates, it's ideal. There you go, Clerodendron number two. Yes. All right, everybody, this is the last of my trifecta of clerodendrons. This one is a late flowering species, so it's going to carry me right through the very late summer, well into the autumn. And it's known as Clerodendron chinensis plenum. Plenum meaning double, so it's a double flowered form. I've never actually seen a single flowered version of this species. It's probably the most cold sensitive of all the clerodendrons I grow. So a reasonable frost will knock it to the ground and it will have to come up from the roots again, but it always seems to do so. And it just wafts gently through the garden bed like many of the other ones do. Its foliage has a slightly unattractive scent to it like most species, but the flowers have got the most incredible heavenly fragrance. It is a beautiful plant to grow. So you get these lovely almost white flowers from dark colored buds and it flowers probably, an individual head will last for some weeks and it will flower right through until mid to late autumn. Frost, as I said, will knock it down every so often, so it can't keep growing up to any great height. But this seems to be about its full height. So, you know, I'm just under two metres, so I guess you could say this is as well. So a plant of around about one and a half to two metres in height, it will eventually branch out and you'll get quite a lot of branches on it. At that point, if the frost hasn't taken it down, the stems will get a bit old and redundant. So I will actually take the whole plant down myself uh, and start it off from fresh canes again. And like all of the other clerodendrons, couldn't be easy to propagate, just dig up suckers. Like most of the species I grow in the garden, they're moderately cold hardy, they seem to perform best in semi-shade, and although they're not water hungry, uh, they do need a modicum of water, but they very quickly tell you if they need a drink because like a hydrangea, their leaves will flag. So make sure you go out in the evening, give them a good drink, and they'll be standing up looking pert by the morning. As you can probably pick from the name, Chinensis, it does come from China, but it also grows down into the Malaysian Peninsula. So it has quite a wide distribution as many of these plants do. But you could know it under another name. There are a range of uh, names that this plant has been known under over the generations. So you might know it by one of its other 23 synonyms. Stephen, Clarodendron. Yes, it is a big genus and there's only a handful of them that I can grow, but what I can grow, I enjoy. And you love a suckering thug. I do love a suckering <laughs> thug. I will probably get to an age where I will regret it when mm. I can't manage my garden as well as I might once have been able to. Mm. But I have visions of myself sitting in my wheelchair on the front veranda looking out and going, isn't it green? Or pointing with your stick at the suckering thugs and getting someone else to yes. chop them down. Yes, yes, some young Amazon who can come in and do the job for me when I need to do it. That's a different YouTube channel. <laughs> yes. Anyway, that was amazing. Thank you very much for taking us around the world of clerodendrons. How could we top this next week, Stephen? 
I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> so well, what can I say? For you to find out what that might be, you'll have to hit subscribe. We do post every week. So hit the alert button and you'll know exactly when our videos land and you'll find out what we're doing. So until then, Stephen. Well, goodbye all. And I expect to see some comments on Chlorodendron. Excellent. See you next week. Bye all.